Today I'm discussing IGCSE paper 22, March 2017. The March exam series is particularly held in India, but of course it gives a good opportunity for all the students all over the world taking the IGCSE examinations of 0620. Okay, so why don't you gra grab a sample of this exam and uh, some blank sheets and calculator and a periodic table. Uh, just keep in mind the threshold boundaries for this exam. Is, is, that's good information for you to keep in mind. A for this exam was 27 out of 40 and B was 23 out of 40. Okay, all right. Let's start off with the first question then. Now the first question here talks about which gas um, could change the color of the universal indicator most quickly. Now what this question is testing is your knowledge of what are the factors which affects the rate of diffusion really and also a bit on the acidic basic behavior of some of the gases which they have mentioned. So uh, you might have studied that the gases which have the least molecular masses they tend to diffuse more quickly but then don't forget hydrogen is kind of neutral it's not acidic or basic so it has no effect on the indicator paper. So now you need to look at the remaining three gases and out of the three gases clearly ammonia has the lowest molecular mass and therefore that's the gas which is going to diffuse the fastest. Alright, so that's why the answer was A. Alright, let's have a look at the second question. Now in the second question, they, they're asking you to figure out the readings which are being highlighted in the two glass uh, equipment, what they have shown. Now, buried reading, well, it starts um, as expected, zero from the top and is 50 at the bottom. And this is the this represents the empty part of the buried, that's where the liquid is. And it clearly shows that's 28 and that's 27. So we have like 10 lines between them. So which means the value of each of these small lines subdivision is 0.1. So that's 28.0, that will be 28.1 and that's 28.2. Which means answer has to be C or D. So you clearly cancelled out choices A and B. Now you need to figure out out of C and D which would be the correct answer. If you look at measuring cylinder, once again that's the liquid part and that's the empty part. Now, the liquid level is at just above 40, but keep in mind between 40 and 50, the difference between this and this is very cleverly, the examiner has given here 10 lines and here the examiner has shown 5 lines, which means uh, 50 minus 40 is 10 and 10 divided by 5. So each subdivision is actually has a value of 2. So that's 40, that's 42 and that's 44. So that's why the answer for this question would be D. Question number three. Now, In question number three, the question talks about which process for purifying the muddy water is shown. Well, um, this question is connected to topic two of your curriculum, uh, which is the separation methods, but also it has uh, some information which is being tested in of topic 11 and air and water, like, you know, water purification involves two major steps, one is filtration. The other one is chlorination. So if you look at these layers, so they're going to act as obviously as filters. That's that's the hint that you should be looking at. And therefore, if you look at off the choices given, and when you're talking of purifying the muddy water, which means it has insoluble solid um, impurities, and that has to be removed by filtration. So particularly the fine sand and the gravel. It removes very small particles, small pebbles can remove big particles. So ultimately what comes out is pretty clean water. So that's filtration. But remember, we can't drink this water because we need to add chlorine before we actually use this water. That's question number three. So that's why the answer of this question was C. Question number four. Which statement explains why isotopes of an element have the same chemical properties? Now, the chemical properties of elements, they depend on what is called as valence electrons. These are the outer shell electrons. And if and if, if you look at, for example, I can give you two isotopes to understand. If you look at carbon, carbon 6, and then you have um, whose mass is 12. And then we have isotope of carbon, which also has the same atomic number, but mass 14. But remember, this is the number of proton, which is also equal to the number of electron. And similarly, the other isotope of carbon has the same number of electrons, which is 6. 
So if you look at the electron distribution, the first shell has two electrons and the second shell has four electrons. So whatever chemical behavior they will show, that's because they have the same number of valence electrons. These are the electrons of the outer shell. Now if you go back to the question, you're looking for something connected to outer shell. So if you look, look here, that's the only one which talks about it. They have the same number of electrons in the outer shell. You see that? That's why the answer of this question is C. Question number five. Now, this question, it talks about you need to figure out what is the correct formula of the compound mentioned and the good thing about this question is they actually gave you the formula of all the ions which to be very honest they should not have because you are now almost a senior finishing IGCSC you kind of must be knowing all the formulas already so if you very quickly look at the formula and you might remember the crisscross method by which we always get the correct formula of the ionic compound which means if you look at aluminium sulfate its valency is 3 and for example, I'll just give you if aluminium has valency 3 plus and sulfate has valency 2 minus, and it's already given here, sulfate is 2 minus there. And therefore, uh, this number here comes below sulfate, and that number goes below aluminium. And that's why the formula becomes Al2SO4. Remember, the 4 is along with S and O, that never changes, but then I need to put that 3 down. Now that looks a bit weird if I have two different numbers. That's why the concept of bracket comes in. And that's why aluminum sulfate is Al2SO4 thrice. You go back on the question, um, Al2SO4 thrice, that looks to be, that obviously is the correct answer there. Calcium nitrate, calcium is 2. I mentioned calcium is 2 there. Uh, I see the 2 there. And, uh, uh, oh sorry, the, the question, the, <laughs> The question said which is not the correct formula okay so aluminium sulfate is the correct formula calcium nitrate calcium is two two i can see the two here nitrate is negative one one we don't write so that formula is perfectly correct iron three okay iron three that's three uh, oh that's the mistake there. that three is supposed to be below bromine okay, i just can explain you this is iron three and bromine is negative 1, which means the correct formula should be FeBr3. Remember, the 3 has to go below bromine. And the mistake you see here, the 3 is immediately after Fe, so that's not correct. So the question said, which formula is not correct? So that's why C was the correct answer, because this formula is not correct. All right? Question number 6. Now, in question number 6, now, uh, please be aware of this new pattern particularly which is emerging now it's very very common in many multiple choice questions where sentences are given and you have more than one choices to look at uh, as a combination answer this particular technique is also used in AS level 9701 exams uh, you will as you start your AS chemistry soon you will find that question number 31 to 40 actually designed by uh, giving some statements and you need to figure out which of those statements are correct. So that's a good skill that you've been exposed to now in IGCSC. So you need to be aware that more than one statement could be correct here. So you have to read each statement very carefully and try to figure out which of our four choices are the correct answer there. Okay, we're talking diamond and SI, silicon four oxide, SiO2. Remember this is from topic three of your curriculum and diamond is a giant macromolecular covalent solid. So is SiO2. Um, well, if, as I said, they are giant macromolecular covalent solids, which, which means if, if you look at the option two, there are, there are strong covalent bonds in diamond. Well, correct, actually, not only in diamond, but also in SiO2. Um, so two, statement number two looks to be correct. This question, this particular statement, both substances are compounds. Well, no, diamond is not a compound. Diamond is an element. Now, if diamond is an element, which means one is wrong. Now, if one is wrong, A cannot be your answer. So that's gone. Now you have choice between B, C, and D. They, are, they definitely have strong covalent bonds because they are giant macromolecule. Um, SiO2 is bonded ionically? No, it doesn't have ionic bonds. To have ionic bonds, it should have a metal and a non-metal. Silicon and oxygen, both are non-metals, which means 3 is wrong. 
Now, if 3 is wrong, this can't be your answer and this cannot be your answer. So, well, now it's easy for you to understand why C was the correct answer. So, even sometimes if you don't understand point number 4, the fact that you already established that this and this cannot be your answer, which means this has to be your possible answer then. So that's why the answer to this question was C. Question number seven. It talks about metals. So this is also part of topic three of your curriculum. Um, it talks about generally about metals. Okay, so layers of positive ions can slide over each other, making metals malleable. I'm kind of sure that you will agree that is the right statement. In fact, that is the reason why metals are malleable. But just to be on the safe side, let's have a look at the other options and try to find out what's the mistake there. But metallic bonding consists of lattice of negative ions. So what's what's the mistake you notice? It's not negative ions. Metals have positive ions. So that is the mistake there. So right? So that's why this is that cannot be your answer there. So because of this, that option B cannot be your answer. Metallic bond consists of lattice of positive ions in a sea of delocalized negative ions. What's the mistake here? Not negative ions, negative electrons or free electrons or delocalized electrons. So that's the mistake in the third option. Metals conduct electricity because positive ions are free to move. Again, a mistake, not positive ions free to move. In fact, the free electrons or delocalized electrons are free to move. So that is why option B, C, D all was wrong. And option A was the right answer. Question number eight. Hydrazine. Um, particularly pay attention to this particular molecule because hydrazine is a very popular molecule the IGCSE exam papers always have. It's one of the rocket fuel which is uh, developed by Cambridge. Now they showed us a combustion reaction of hydrazine it is producing nitrogen and H2O. Okay, once again the same pattern, um, you have been given option um, statements and you need to figure out which are, which are the correct options, combinations from here. This statement says one mole of hydrazine gives 72 dm cube of gaseous products. Okay, well these are the products. I have one mole of N2 and I have two moles of H2O and they're coming in from one mole of hydrazine. So one mole of hydrazine is giving me three moles of the gaseous product. Now keep in mind one mole of anything at RTP has a volume 24 dm cube. Now if I have three mole of something which means I have three times 24 and that is why the answer is 72 dm cube. So if you look at that little calculation there um, option one is correct which means this can this is okay this is okay and this cannot be your answer and this cannot be your answer because it does not have option one so now out of four choices your attention should be only for these two option a or option b second point says empirical formula of hydrazine is nh2 now empirical formula remember that the molecular formula is n2h4 the empirical formula is always the simplest formula simplest combination ratio is 2 ratio 4 at this point in time so the simplest ratio of combination is 1 ratio 2 if i divide both the numbers by 2 and that is how i get nh2 it means n is 1 and h is 2 so nh2 so if you look at option 2 it looks correct but i have option 2 correct here and correct here which means i must check the option 3 the total number of atoms in one mole of hydrazine is six times Avogadro's number. Total number of atoms. Now, to find total number of atoms, now the formula of hydrazine is N2H4. I see two moles of nitrogen atoms and I see four moles of hydrogen atoms, which means I have six moles of atoms in one molecule of N2H4. Since I have six moles of atoms to, to change the moles into number of atoms I need to multiply this by the Avogadro's constant so if I look at the options given it says the total number of atoms in one mole of hydrazine is six times Avogadro's constant so it's correct so option three is also correct which means 
answer has to be A, not B. So that's why the answer to this question is A. Question number nine. This question is from topic four, stoichiometry um, concept in your curriculum, popularly called as Mohs concept. Now here, when equation is given, copper carbonate is being heated to form copper oxide plus CO2. They give you the mass of copper carbonate, 31 grams, which is being heated. And uh, the yield of copper 2 oxide, that's the copper 2 oxide, remember it's black in color, is 17.5. Using this information, your job is to find out what's the percentage yield. Now remember the percentage yield has a formula. To find percentage A, you need to find the actual mass over calculated mass times 100 or sometimes we say given mass upon uh, theoretical mass times 100. So let's have a look at the information again. I have copper carbonate giving me copper oxide. Okay, so copper carbonate and I have copper oxide. So the first thing I'm going to do is look at the equation, it's all correctly balanced. I'm going to use what is called as mass ratio. Um, I'm going to take the mass of one mole of copper carbonate, which is the MR, and I'm going to take the MR of copper oxide. So if I take the MR of copper carbonate, and I can use a calculator, that is 64, that's for copper, plus 12, that's for carbon, and 3 times 16, that's for oxygen, and the whole thing comes out to be 124. That's the MR of copper carbonate. Similarly, for copper, that is 64, and oxygen is 16. I add up everything, it comes 80. So apparently, according to my theoretical calculations, 124 grams of this should give me 80 grams of that. Now, according to the question, we heated 31 grams of copper carbonate. So I'm going to heat 31 grams of copper carbonate. So how much? That would be X. So when I find X, that's 31 times 80 divided by 124 and this after calculation comes to be 20 grams. Now remember this is the theoretical yield but if I look at the question it says the actual amount of copper oxide was only 17.5. So 17.5 which means uh, percentage yield equals to 17.5 that was the actual what was made. 20 is according to our calculation times 100 and when you solve this out and that is how we get 87.5% um, um, as the answer that. So that's why the answer to this question was 87.5. Alright, so we'll have a quick look again. So that's right. so basically what we did was we found we had to find this value. This is a what we say a theoretical value which we had to find using a mole ratio concepts. Question number 10. Question number 10 is from the topic electricity and uh, chemistry. This is electrolysis lesson topic number 5 of your curriculum. And uh, copper sulfate aqueous electrolysis is, comes under the category of recall topics and I would strongly recommend that you actually memorize the two electrolysis involving copper sulfate. One is using inert electrodes, could be carbon or platinum or could be using copper electrodes. So I would strongly advise that you should kind of have to know the equations and the observations that goes with it. All right, so let's have a look at copper sulfate aqueous electrolysis using inert electrodes. So we have, these are the, the two ions coming from copper sulfate. And since it's a solution, it will also contain H plus and OH minus ions. Now what happens in this electrolysis is at cathode, now remember cathode is negative, so one of the two positive ions are going to come and the concept that you're going to use is we select the ion of the less reactive. Now if you look at the reactivity series, you'll find this in your topic 10 metals, in your metals textbook pages. You'll find that the copper is less reactive than hydrogen. So I'm going to take the ion of copper, that's the one who actually picks up the two electrons. Uh, it's a very easy trick for you to keep in mind. If you look at that plus there, you just copy out that plus, and you see there are two, so just put two electrons. That's an easy way to learn these equations. So if you see three, just put here three. If you see one, you just put here one. And that's how you get copper atom. So at cathode, the copper ion gains the electrons. And if you look at the options there, um, 
it says copper metal is deposited at the positive electrode. The positive electrode is anode and according to our chemistry, what we know, copper is deposited at cathode. So that's why A cannot be the answer. Now look at what happens at anode. Now at anode, in IGCSC, what you have studied, that either you're going to pick up the OH- minus or the halide, you kind of don't study much about the other negative ions, but in A-level, uh, you will come across um, something called as data booklet, and you'll find a lot of equations, half equations involving other ions. As of now, uh, just restrict yourself to either selecting the OH- minus or the halide ion. But remember, the OH- minus is being picked up, uh, particularly when it comes to copper sulfate across electrolysis, uh, we don't have equations involving sulfate, carbonate, nitrates, and so on in IGCSC. So the equation involving OH minus is basically the 4 OH minus. It's, it changes into 2 H2O plus oxygen plus 4 electrons. That's the equation that you have to learn what happens at anode. Now, in this equation, you clearly see the oxygen gas has been released at anode. And if you go back to the question, you look at that option there oxygen gas is being produced um, at, at anode. So that is why option D was the correct answer for this question. So this question is based on recall and as I said some of the recall topics you get about 32-33% of the examinations from the recall part of the curriculum. So it's important that you actually should know these topics, memorize these topics. Question number 11. This question is also continues to be on the topic of electrolysis and the question is asking in which experiments colorless gas is going to be evolved at anode. Once again you see the pattern of the question still asking you to choose between the statements mentioned. So this is a very important skill you need to pick up. Okay, uh, which of the two experiments could give you a colorless gas at the anode? So all the electrodes are made of carbon here. Again these are the copper electrodes. Okay, and uh, so let's have a look at option one, dilute sodium chloride at carbon. So dilute sodium chloride, so we got Na plus, we got Cl minus, remember it's a solution, so we have H plus and we also have OH minus because it's a solution. And it's dilute, keep that in mind, so which means uh, we're talking of anode here, so anode, so we're talking of these gases, these negative ions. If it's dilute, the rule that you study in IGCC, you need to pick up the OH minus. And once again, it's the same equation that you just now did in the previous equation. You get 4 OH minus gives you 2 H2O plus O2 plus 4 electrons. So and oxygen is a colorless gas. So they wanted some gas which is colorless. So one looks to be okay, which means answer could be A or B. You see what happened? Out of the four choices, we clearly know C and D cannot be the answer. So we have clearly to choose between A and B. So let's have a look at option two, aqueous copper sulfate. Now aqueous copper sulfate using copper electrodes. Now this is a refining of copper. And at, at, we're talking of anode, but during copper sulfate aqueous electrolysis using copper electrodes, the reaction which happens at anode is that the electrons are lost. So basically the impure copper is going to lose the electron and change into copper ions. And as you see, that's the equation which is happening there. And there is no gas released in this equation. So clearly, if I go back on the question, option two is not correct, which means A cannot be the answer. Which means even if I don't have to check, four has to be the right choice. So that's why the answer was one and four. Question number 12. This question is from topic 6, energy changes of your curriculum. Now, this question talks about how would you find out the total energy change of a reaction and certain bond energies have been mentioned. Now, remember the concept is the total energy change of a reaction equals to the energy required to break all the bonds on the reactant side minus the, uh, the bonds which are formed on the product side. So, basically, the energy of bond breaking minus energy of bond forming. Now, if I, and they also gave you the, the kind of bonds that the reactants and products has. Now, nitrogen has a triple bond, and that's the bond energy. Hydrogen has a single bond. But remember, there are three moles of hydrogen, so you need to multiply this by three. So how this question goes is, you know, since you have an equation, N2 
plus 3 H2 gives 2 NH3. So what you are doing is you are breaking N triple bond here. You are breaking 3 moles of HH single bonds. And uh, could you try to guess how many NH bonds do you think you are going to make total on the right hand side? You see there are 3 NH bonds inside and you need to times it by 2. So you basically have 6 NH bonds on your right and you have 1 NN triple bond and 3 HH single bond. So you go back on your table, the triple bond is 945. So that's 945 and uh, you got 436. So that's 3 into 436. So that's the total energy required to break all the bonds minus uh, minus 6 times uh, NH. NH bond is 390. 390. So basically if I add this up minus this answer I should get negative 87 which is D as my answer. So just have a look at with your own calculators and just see whether the answer matches. Question number 13. This question, this is also connected to topic 6 of your curriculum. Which row describes the energy change? Now what you should remember in the, from learning from those lessons is, if your graph starts high and ends low, that's exothermic. So remember, a typical exothermic is going to start high and end low. So that's basically exo. And a typical endo will start low and end high. That's that's an easy giveaway to, to understand the difference between exo and endo. All right. So the question was clearly starting high and ending low. So answer has to be exo, which means I see exo here as uh, I see exo here and I see exo here, so which means answer has to be B or D. So A and C are, cannot be the answer. Now, if I look at uh, uh, the concept, the concept says a reaction is exo uh, when less energy is required to break the bond and a lot of energy goes out. So that is what makes the reaction exo. So that's a good concept for you to understand. So if less energy goes in, a lot of energy goes out, it makes the reaction exo. It's the other way for the endo. So let's have a look here. Um, more energy is given out when the bonds in the product are formed than it's needed. Correct. If you look at that statement carefully, more energy is given out when the bonds in the product are formed. So when product are formed, lots of energy is given out compared to energy required to break. So that's why B was the right answer there. Question number 14. This question is from topic 7 of your curriculum. Uh, it talks about rate of reactions, factors affecting rate, equilibria and redox. Now, in this question, it's only about the rate of reaction and the question says which changes can increase the rate of reaction. Well, to increase the rate of reaction, the concentration, if it increases, it definitely can increase the rate of reaction. So, one is correct. You might, you might have studied more the concentration, more the particles per unit volume, more the collisions and therefore faster the rate of reaction. So clearly one is correct, answer could be A, could be B. Once again, out of the four choices, you have selected two choices and cancelled two choices out. Now you have a 50% chance to score the correct mark. Now if you look at the second option, increasing the size of particles. Now what have you studied? I'm sure you have done barbecue. You must have crushed the coal. The whole idea of crushing the coal before barbecue is to, so that they burn easily. The point being, smaller the particles, faster they burn. But if you make the particles bigger, they're going to react slower, which means two should not be the correct option. So, but then there is no option two in either of these two, so we're just going to ignore it. Increasing the temperature, yes, we know. If temperature increases, we know kinetic energy increases, particles collide more effectively. So three looks good. But again, both of them have option 3, so which means now we have to look at option 4. 
increasing the volume. Now, among all the factors which affects the rate of reaction, volume never affects the rate. That has got nothing to do. So, the vol increasing the volume or decreasing the volume doesn't affect the rate of reaction. So, clearly, 4 cannot be the correct answer. So, answer cannot be A. And that is why the answer is B. Question number 15. Now, this question is, is from topic 7. Um, again, rate of reaction, particularly um, the concept of photochemical reactions. Now, remember, photochemical reactions are reactions in which light can affect the, the rate of the reaction. If you look at option B, it's in your organic chemistry notes under the heading of substitution reaction, and which is controlled by the presence of ultraviolet or light. So B is a photochemical reaction. Photosynthesis is photochemical. It happens in the presence of light. And the silver bromide decomposing to form silver, that's the reaction happening, happening in photography. So that's all B, C and D are photochemical reaction. But burning of a candle is not a photochemical reaction. It does not need light to make the candle to burn. So that's why the question said, which is not affected by the presence of light. So that's why answer is A. Question number 16. This question is from topic 7, equilibrium concepts. Um, these questions, some of them are considered to be a little of higher intensity when it comes to um, the degree of difficulty. Uh, important clue, the forward reaction is exothermic. Uh, just a few points to keep in mind. The forward reaction is exothermic. It means delta H is negative and forward is exo. Remember, if forward is exo, that's what increases temperature. And good to know, if forward is exo, backward will be endo and that's where the temperature is going to go down okay back to the question uh, which statement is correct increase in pressure has no effect on the equilibrium position now let's have a look when you talk of pressure you need to check the gas moles i see one plus one two gas moles i see two gas moles they are equal gas number of gas moles on both sides so option a is the correct answer. We were lucky we got the correct answer in the first option itself. However, if you want to check the remaining options, let's have a look. If you look at option B, the purple color fades away when reaction mixture is heated. Now remember, uh, since forward reaction is exo, if you increase temperature, the equilibrium will try to oppose the change by favoring the side which reduces the temperature. Now, the one which reduces temperature is backward. So, it's going to shift equilibrium to the left. And if it shifts to the left, um, here the point says purple color fades away. But actually, if the equilibrium comes towards the left, it actually is going to become more purple. So, which means option B is not correct. The third one, which equilibrium, when equilibrium is reached, both forward and reverse reactions stop? No. At equilibrium, the rate of forward and the backward is same. That's the whole point of equilibrium. Reactions don't stop. So that's the mistake in this part. When more hydrogen is added, the purple color increases. Well, if you're going to add more hydrogen here, the equilibrium will be shifted to the right. The purple color will become colorless. They said purple color increases. Actually, purple color decreases. So that's why option D was wrong. So that's why A was the correct answer for this question. Question number 17. This question is also of, from topic number 7, the last part of topic 7, which is the redox concept. And the question talks about which one do you think is the oxidizing agent? Uh, you might have studied oxidation and reduction based on the oxygen or the electrons. But, you know, that probably might confuse you because when you look at these equations, you don't find oxygen, you don't find electrons. And that might kind of you know, put a lot of doubt in many students' minds. The trick is to use oxidation number rather than anything else. So, uh, if you look at the equation, it talks about Cl2 plus 2KBr gives 2KCl plus Br2. Correct? That's the equation. Yeah, okay. So, the concept of oxidation number. Now, remember, being element, the oxidation number of chlorine is zero. And oxidation number of bromine also would be zero because elements have oxidation number zero all the time. But here in a compound, the oxidation number of chlorine is negative one, and the bromine is negative one. Now, if you look here, from chlorine's oxidation number from zero, from zero it became minus one. 
a decrease in oxidation number means reduction. So chlorine got reduced. So if chlorine got reduced, concept that you must keep in mind, therefore chlorine acts as oxidizing agent. Oxidizing agent. They are also referred as oxidant. So chlorine is an oxidizing agent because, because it got reduced. In fact, bromide from negative one became zero. So bromide got oxidized. So bromide acts as a reducing agent. So here the question was talking about who is the oxidizing agent. Remember the oxidizing agent has to get reduced. So the oxidizing agent has to get reduced. So chlorine got reduced. So that is why the correct answer was chlorine. And don't forget there's a difference between chlorine and chloride. Um, quite a few students don't get this one. Chlorine is Cl2. That's chlorine molecule. Or that's a chlorine atom. This is chloride ion. So that's two different things. You could say it's a chloride, chlorine ion. But remember this is chloride ion. And that's chlorine atom. And that's chlorine molecule. So don't confuse between the different particles there. Question number 18. This question is from topic 8, acid bases salts of your curriculum. Um, the reason I'm also telling you the, the lesson numbers is you know, I want you to make you understand that there's a definite trend when you when you look at a typical past paper, how it goes from which question, from question number 1 to question number 40. It goes through your curriculum and in some lessons you'll find 2-3 questions in topic 7 as you see we saw just now almost 4 questions came. Some lessons you get only one question, so it's good to know, keep a track of which question is from which lesson. And if you do a few past papers, you actually get a very clear idea or pattern of how many questions usually comes from each particular lesson of your curriculum. Now this is from topic 8 and uh, talks about beryllium oxide. Obviously you don't know about beryllium oxide, you studied about other metal oxides, non-metal oxides, but you did not study about beryllium oxide. But what the examiner is testing is your concept. It tests that if it, if it reacts with acid and it also reacts with a base, and what you have studied in topic 8 is an oxide called aluminium oxide, which also reacts with acid and base. And since it reacts with acid and base, it's called an amphoteric oxide. And that's why beryllium oxide is also going to be called as an amphoteric oxide. So that's why the answer is B. Question number 19. This question is from topic 8, acid base salts. And it's again testing your knowledge on the general properties of acid. It talks about two acids, W and X, and uh, they are reacting separately with uh, excess amount of magnesium. And these are the two observations. The hydrogen gases produce much at a faster rate with W. Now, if W is going to produce hydrogen faster, it, it kind of means that W could be a stronger acid compared to X. But interestingly, the total volume of the hydrogen gas is same for both. Now, that, with that means, the concentration could be same for both the acids. You could have two different acids with, with kind of same concentration, and that's the reason why the total amount of H2 gas produced doesn't change. But then yet, W is reacting faster, which kind of means that W must be a stronger acid compared to X. So if you look at the options given, that is why C was the correct choice. Now the reason why, the reason why in case uh, you want explanation why A cannot be the answer. pH of W is higher. No, if the pH is higher, actually it becomes a weaker acid. Stronger acids have lower pH. So that that was a mistake. Then. W is an organic acid. No, all organic acids are weak acids. And here the, clearly they said uh, W is reacting faster with magnesium. So it can't be an organic acid. W is more concentrated. No, if W was more concentrated, then the amount of hydrogen gas shouldn't be same for both the gases. So that is why the correct option for this question was C. Question number 20. This question is from the last part of topic 8, uh, which talks about tests for cations and ions and the flame test for gases. Uh, that part of the curriculum you have to absolutely memorize. I mean, you have to know all the tests for all the ions and gases. There is no other way out. Now, you've been given copper sulfate and um, the question talks about which test could prove that the solution was copper sulfate. Now, remember copper gives copper ion gives blue color precipitate with NOH or with ammonia. 
So if you look at the options there, adding aqueous sodium hydroxide, that looks to be a good option because if I'm going to add NaOH, I'm definitely going to see a blue precipitate insoluble in excess NaOH. So I need to see option two, which means answer has to be C or D, one of these two, because they have option two. Now option three, if I add nitric acid and silver nitrate, don't forget that silver nitrate is only useful identifying the presence of chloride, bromide or iodide. This is sulfate. Sulfate is tested by a barium ion. So that, therefore, uh, that's why I, I, need, I need option 4. If I look at option 4, the moment I put barium combined with sulfate to give me the white precipitate of BASO4. And that is why D was the correct choice, not 3. Question number 21. This question talks about salt repression. This is in topic 8. Now, if you look at the diagram, the way it's been highlighted, crushing solid, dissolving in excess amount of, <coughs> um, could be an acid solution, and filtering out the insoluble, and heating out the filtrate for complete uh, for the crystallization process. Now, when you look at that technique, it fits the profile for copper sulfate. Why not barium sulfate? Uh, because barium sulfate is insoluble. The pre preparation of insoluble salts follow a different procedure. It involves basically mixing two solutions and filtering the um, solid salt out, which is not as per what they have shown. Also, why can't be C and D? For these kind of salts, usually we do the acid-based titration techniques to make these salts. So the crystals usually fits the profile for copper sulfate. Question number 22. This question is on topic 9, periodic table. Now, we, we, this question talks about when you go from left to right across a period, what actually happens. Now, if you look at the options, metallic character, uh, we, we're talking of something which should increase. Now, that's the important point. The metallic character decreases when you go left to right. On your right hand side, you have non metal, so A can't be the answer. Number of electron shells, but if you go left to right in a period, the number of shells don't change. So B cannot be the answer. Number of outer shell electrons, remember these are also called as valence electrons. And yes, it's the valence electron which changes. And that is why C was the correct answer. Question number 23. This question has come from topic 9, same lesson. And it talks about elements of group 2. Calcium versus magnesium. Now don't forget calcium is below magnesium and what you study in that lesson is as you go down the metal group the reactivity increases which means calcium must react faster. The statement is correct. Answer could be A, could be B, could be C. So we definitely know D is not the answer. If you look at option 2, barium reacts less vigorously than magnesium. No. Barium is much below magnesium, which means barium should react much faster. The second option is not correct, which means A cannot be the answer, B cannot be the answer. So the only option left is C. And that is why C was the correct answer for this question. Even without reading the option 3, you could come to that conclusion. Question number 24. This question is again from topic 9, periodic table, and it talks about the so-called Nobel gases. Why are they unreactive? Well, this is a very standard question, and I'm sure most of you already know the answer. The reason why they are unreactive because they have a fully filled outer shell. And if you look at the option B, that's why it was a very straightforward question. They, they have fully fully filled outer shells. Uh, their valency is zero. They don't need to combine with any other element. So the correct answer to this question was C. Question number 25. This question is also from topic 9. It talks about transition elements because the question talks about who could be a catalyst. That's one of the properties shown by a uh, transition elements. Apart from they have been having variable oxidation states, um, they have high densities. So being a catalyst, now transition element, don't forget, are in the middle of the periodic table. The only element what they have shown in the middle is D. So that is why D was the correct choice for this question. Question number 26. This is from topic 10, metals. Uh, but particularly pay attention to the very important word, which is applicable to all the metals. They are all attracted by magnet. No, not every metal. 
a few selected ones. And in senior classes, you'll study more advanced reasons as to why this behavior is shown. So A is not the answer. They are weak and brittle? Definitely not. Some metals are not. All of them are not weak and brittle. Them. Most of them are actually strong. They may be used to form alloys. Yes, metals can be mixed together to form alloys. All of them. So which means C looks to be the correct choice. They react with water. Well, again, no. Not every metal reacts with water. Copper, gold, silver, they don't react with water. So that's why C was the correct choice. Question number 27. Uh, this question was again from topic 10. Which substance produced sulfur dioxide when roasted in air? Well, this is something direct from your topic 10 notes. Uh, of the choices given, if you look at zinc blend, I'll just give you a quick um, uh, idea here. Zinc blend is ZNS and you basically roast this with oxygen to form zinc oxide plus SO2. So this was the first reaction in the extraction of zinc. And the second reaction was zinc oxide was then reacted with carbon to form zinc plus carbon monoxide. So if you look at the equation, that is why zinc blend was the correct answer for this question. This was a recall based question, which means this, these are the concepts what you should actually just memorize from the notes. Question number 28. From topic 10 again, um, keep a watch on how many questions come from each lesson. As I said, it gives you a fair idea of how the questions are spread across your 14 lessons in your syllabus. Which metal carbonate does not produce carbon dioxide when heated with a Bunsen burner flame? Well, copper carbonate um, will break down. Magnesium carbonate will break down to form magnesium oxide plus CO2. Sodium carbonate will not break down. The reason that's group one, but what you have memorized in this uh, topic 10 uh, part of the curriculum is that the group 1 metal carbonates, uh, they don't decompose, uh, sodium carbonate cannot be broken down using Bunsen burner flame, um, and but the other carbonates can easily be broken down using that, that temperature. Bunsen burner flame is not considered to be a very high temperature flame, uh, but of course excessive heating things can be broken down, but in this case sodium carbonate decomposition with Bunsen burner flame is not possible, so that's why the answer is C. Question number 29. This question again connected to topic uh, 10, uh, properties of metals, particularly with respect to copper, copper's reactivity, um, position in the reactivity series with respect to hydrogen. Good to know, copper is less reactive than hydrogen. Now if you look at the first experiment, steam is being uh, passed over copper. Now remember in this equation, if you're going to put steam and copper together, copper is less reactive than hydrogen which means it cannot displace hydrogen out, so which means there is going to be no reaction for this one. So in experiment number one, there has to be no reaction. Answer has to be A or B. But then in my second experiment, I heated copper oxide and carbon. So copper oxide and carbon, that's a pretty standard um, equation. Copper com comes under the category of a bit less than average reactive metal. So copper will be displaced and I can get carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide. Accordingly, I have to balance the equation. So here the reaction is going to happen. So that's why the correct answer would be. Question number 30. Which two gases are obtained by from liquid air by fractional distillation? Well, this is from topic 11. And again, this is coming from your recall part of your curriculum, which you have to memorize that from liquid air, the two gases which are particularly removed is nitrogen and oxygen. Uh, that's why the answer was C. Question number 31. This is from topic 11, air and water. You have 150 cm cube of the polluted air. Okay. And uh, there is some damp iron wool, which means we are expecting rusting. And for rusting, we need oxygen, which is going to be used up from the air. And the question says, after one week, the air was only 122. So, which means the difference between 150 and 122 is the amount of oxygen which is present. And you're supposed to find that oxygen and then convert that into a percentage um, is how much percentage of 150 it is. So, basically, uh, two simple steps. You first of all subtract. So, you do a 150 minus, um, how much was it? 122. So, when you subtract these two, you get 28 cm cube. So, this was the amount of oxygen which must have been used up. Don't forget 240 
rusting to happen, we need oxygen, so that oxygen is going to come from air. And then the question said convert that into a percentage, so that's 28 divided by the original, which is 150, times it by 100. And then when you calculate, and that is why you get A as your answer for this question. Question number 32. Uh, two equations mentioned, and the question says, what kind of reactions do you think it's happening? Well, if you want to change CH4 into CO2, that's definitely a combustion equation, complete combustion actually. But they use the word, well, out of definitely no heating. This is simple uh, burning of methane, so answer has to be A or B. However, if you heat CaCO3, then you get calcium oxide plus CO2. That's thermal decomposition, which means the correct answer is B. So combustion, X is combustion, and Y is thermal decomposition. It just simply means heating calcium carbonate to form calcium oxide plus CO2. So that's why the correct answer is B. Question number 33. This question uh, talks about Haber process and contact process. Don't forget uh, the contact process gives us H2SO4, Haber process gives us ammonia. Um, the catalyst is used for Haber process is Fe, catalyst used for contact process is V2O5, vanadium 5 oxide. And when these two react, we get ammonium sulfate. Now, if you look at the options given, it says which row do you think is absolutely correct. Now, we definitely know Haber process does not use vanadium 5 oxide, so that's not correct. Contact uses vanadium 5 oxide. Contact does not use Fe, so that's not right. A is not right, B is not right. Haber uses Fe, contact uses V2O5. So these two looks okay. And uh, so now we have to see which are the correct, out of C and D, which is the correct statement. So the ions present in ammonium sulfate are formed when, okay, both these processes involve using that, which row is correct. Now, if you look at C and D, which one do you think? If you look at sulfuric acid forming sulfate, but what's the mistake here? Haber is wrong. Remember for Haber, it's ammonia, not sulfuric acid. So this is not right. But if you look at this one, contact process involves manufacture of sulfuric acid. It uses catalyst vanadium 5 oxide. And sulfate iron obviously is one of the product there. So everything is correct for C. Remember, the mistake in D is sulfuric acid in Haber. That's the mistake. Haber does not involve sulfuric acid. It involves ammonia. And that's why D was not the right answer. C was the right answer. Question number 34. Um, this question is introduction towards the organic chemistry, particularly fractions of petroleum, uses of those fractions, one of them gasoline, um, also called petrol. Now, if you look at the, the data given, and the question says, which type of petroleum is best for motor vehicles? Now, remember, motor vehicles, they need gasoline, which is also another way of saying petroleum. Uh, petrol, sorry. So, gasoline. So, if I look at uh, the the North Sea, if I have North Sea, I have gasoline 23%, uh, and uh, which is the highest among all. So, clearly, I need this as much as possible. And it also gives a fair amount of good numbers if, if I look at kerosene, which is also used as a fuel for heavy vehicles. So I'm getting a decent amount of uh, kerosene and gasoline from there, which is 15 is again the top number in this row, 23 is the top number in this row. And I also need diesel, which is um, kerosene is sorry uh, used as aviation fuel or paraffin. Diesel is the fuel used for heavy vehicles there. I have a pretty good amount of diesel coming in from there and motor fuel oil is used for ships so I have uh, again not so bad but then if you look at the average numbers North Sea has pretty good numbers for all these fuels which are used for motor industry so that's why the correct answer is D. Question number 35 organic chemistry which reaction of ethene is not an addition reaction now addition reaction involves alkenes reacting with different species now uh, reacting with bromine to form dibromo, reacting with hydrogen to change, let's say, for example, ethene to ethane, uh, reacting with steam to change change ethene to ethanol. But reacting with oxygen is combustion of ethene. This is not an addition reaction. That is why the answer was C. Question number 36. Organic chemistry question again. Uh, so in compounds of how many homologous series appear in these equations? Well, if you look at this, this is C4H10, that's alkane. 
c to h4 is alkene and that is alkene so in my first equation i have an alkene i have an alkene in my second equation i have an alkene and the homologous series which means h2 is not applicable right this is alcohol that's my third member so i have alkene i have an alkene and now i have an alcohol this is an alcohol not applicable not applicable not applicable which means total number of homologous series we could spot was i have an alkene i have an alkene and we have an alcohol we have three different homologous series so that's why the answer is c question number 37 organic chemistry again um, what kind of chemical reaction changes ethene to ethanol that's definitely as we were just discussing that's an example of an addition reaction right so when you add steam to ethene uh, we get ethanol so answer has to be a or b and when you change sugar to ethanol you do a process that's called fermentation so that's why if you look at the both the options answer was a for this question question number 38 organic chemistry again um, the earlier part of the lesson which talks about the IUPAC nomenclature this is where you learn the skills of how to name the compounds well if you if you look at this compound there um, let me help you out here this is um, CH3 CH2 COO CH3 okay yeah okay now the trick to 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 learn the naming of esters is you should know how the esters are formed so basically esters are formed by by reacting a carboxylic acid that's the part which comes from the carboxylic acid and that's the part which comes from the alcohol so you basically have a three carbon acid so which means this is this is coming from propanoic acid and this is coming from the alcohol and this alcohol has only one carbon so the way we name the esters, we name this part first and then this part. This part is the alkyl part. So I have one carbon. So that's methyl. Remember, et, elk is the number of carbon. One carbon is meth, two is eth, three is prot, four is but, and so on. This part is the alkane oid. So I've got one, two, three, that's three carbons, a three carbon alkane, that's propane, propane. And then I, I've got to finish the name with O8. So that's basically how we name the esters. It's alkyl alkanoid, that's methyl propanoid. Let's have a look at the options. Methyl propanoid, there you go. That's the option that we have, option C. Question number 39. This is organic chemistry addition polymerization or how do we know it's addition polymerization and not condensation don't forget condensation involves the amide link and the ester link i don't see that anywhere it's a simple hydrocarbon chains definitely uh, the monomer has to be alkene and this is um, a simple case of addition polymerization where all the monomers join together to form only a polymer so it's definitely addition polymerization we're adding stuff we're not breaking them so it's a or b and addition polymerization is only shown by alkenes, not alkane. So that is why B is the correct answer. Really, really hope that you would have found this particular discussion useful. Please don't uh, hesitate to share this on your on your wall with, with your friends um, to help them out if they need any any kind of assistance. I would love to hear from you. Uh, any comments, any feedback, any improvements that I could do, or any other comments that, that comes in your mind as you go through these uh, questions um, do write to me um, if you like this video and uh, if it has helped you to learn the concepts uh, very best of luck and i hope to make more videos in future and see you again next time ciao